throughout my life, from the time that I was in high school until today, I have worked in so many places and I have done so many things. I worked at a deli store, I worked in a grocery store, I worked as a dishwasher in a restaurant, I worked as a delivery guy, I worked in a department store at Sears selling TVs, so on and so forth. But one experience that stood out from all the rest is working as a car salesman. Now, there's no shame in doing all the jobs that I just mentioned, whether it's being a delivery man or a dishwasher or working in a deli store or whatever the case may be. You want to support yourself. You want to support your family. And maybe that was the only opportunity that you had or maybe the only job that was offered to you and you took it because you want to support yourself and your family. There's no shame in doing whatever you want to do as long as you give it your 100% and you do the job right. But what I see as being wrong is when you do not think about a better future. You do not think about learning new things so you can become a better person and achieve a much higher level than where you are right now. Life will stop when you stop learning. Life will become boring when you stop learning. I've been in this business, in the electronics repair business for almost 10 years now and every single day I'm learning something new. Every single day I'm learning something new. Like for example, today, where is it? Today I got this device. I never worked on this device before. It's a GM car scanner. Some type of scanner for cars so you can troubleshoot GM vehicles. I never worked on this device before. What do I do? Should I send it back to the customer and tell him I do not work on it? I can do so if I want. Now the customer who mailed this over wrote a letter. He said, I know you do not work on those. I know there are no circuit diagrams available for those devices, but if you would look at it and see if you can figure out why the device is not turning on. What I will do, I will open it, I will look inside, I will look under the microscope, I will try to figure out how the circuit works. And if I did figure out how that circuit works and I fix it, I will feel happy. I learned something new. Now I know how to fix those devices. Now, before making the video, I knew that I may get carried away and keep on talking and talking and talking. I do not want to do that. So let me cut to the chase and go straight to why I wanted to make this video. From all the jobs that I got, the one job that stood out was being a car salesman. Now, I was never a car salesman. I do not know what goes on when dealing with the customer, how to sell the car, how to negotiate, how to write up the customer, how to overcome obstacles and all that stuff. How did I become a car salesman? What part in my life was I working as a car salesman? And how did I end up being a car salesman? I mean, I would have never thought in my life that one day I may be selling cars. I graduated from Polytechnic University, Bachelor in Electrical Engineering. My family and I moved to California and I was pursuing a job being an electrical engineer. I also had passion for electronics repair. And uh, at that time, I did not know how to start a business or what it takes to start a business and if that business will work or not. So I was looking for a job as an electrical engineer. Now, while looking for a job, I was offered to work in a car dealership being a car salesman. And I was told that I will make a lot of money selling cars and I can really make a career out of being a car salesman. And that's absolutely true. You make a lot of money selling cars and if you have a lot of customers, you can make a lot of money. But I do not want to be a car salesman. I graduated in electrical engineering. My passion is electronics and I want to pursue the field. So I thought to myself, why not take the offer of being a car salesman, working in a busy car dealership, and then when I find my dream job, I will just stop working as a car salesman and I will move on to working for that company. I accepted the offer, working as a car salesman, until I find what I want to do. So I got the job and training began. Training began and it's a lot of training. Being a car salesman, it's a lot of training and it's all about psychology. It's all about how people think. And I'll go over it. I'll try to make it as brief as possible because this video can end up being two, three hours easily. In life, you can learn in three ways. You can learn from your parents, you can learn from school, and you can learn from the street, from dealing with people out in the open, from communicating with people like a car dealership. The first thing we learned in a car dealership is you do not greet the customer by, can I help you? You never say that in a car dealership because if that customer tells you, no, thanks, I do not need help, it's game over. You cannot communicate with that customer anymore. Previously, when I worked in a department store at Sears selling TVs, we learned that we have to approach a customer and ask if that customer needed help. Hello, sir, do you need help? Can I help you? But working at a dealership, it's totally different. You do not approach and ask if that customer needs help. 
So how do we approach the customer in a car dealership? We have to approach the customer with a question. Hello, my name is Alex, what's yours? I put my hand in front of him, my name is Alex, what's yours? Any normal human being is gonna answer you back. Hi, my name is John. Hello, John. And we go along with another question. Are you looking for a van, car, truck, or SUV? Now you give the customer four options. So he must be coming to buy one of those. The customer will be like, um, I was looking for a car. Oh, great. So are you looking for light or dark color? And now maybe the customer is a little bit afraid to continue. Maybe he does not want to be committed to going inside to buy a car. Because anytime you have a customer that's coming in to buy a car, they will think 100 times before they buy a car because the car is $30,000, $40,000. He's not buying a $10 item. Uh, it's a big item and they come in with their guards on their face. Like, you know, they do not want to talk to anybody or they're coming in to fight. So I told you that it's all about psychology and how you deal with the customer. Uh, if you noticed, I'm always asking the customer questions because the person who is asking is stronger than the person who is answering. When somebody asks you a question, you get put in a position where you have to answer, with exception to those 5% of people who may not answer you, but majority of the people or human beings, when you ask a question, they will answer you back. So if you notice, when I'm talking to the customer, I'm always in the question mode, and the customer is always in the answering mode. That's what they teach us. It's all about psychology. Uh, every single day, they get you somebody who trains you on how people think and how to deal with people and all that stuff. I'll get to it. So now I'm asking the customer, are you looking for light or dark colored vehicle? Now the customer is at a point where he may feel pressured. Maybe he tells you, um, you know what, I'm not sure, I'm just looking. Oh, it's okay, you can look, but I'm trying to help you find the vehicle that you may be looking for. So I'm looking for, I prefer white color. Great, follow me, follow me. When you tell the customer to follow you and you walk in front of him, the customer is gonna follow you, human nature. Customer follows you. What do you think about this car? We have this, we have this, we have this. Uh, are you looking for two doors or four doors? Again, with the questions. Two doors or four doors? Oh no, I prefer four doors because I have uh, three family members. Great, so that's the car. Let's take it for a ride. Oh no, no, I'm not ready to take it for a ride. I have to talk with my wife. You have nothing to lose. Just take it for the ride. It's not gonna cost you anything. And you get the customer inside the vehicle. Now, when you get the customer inside the vehicle, they train you that you have to talk about everything inside that vehicle. We are trained to talk about everything inside the vehicle, all the details. Look at this vehicle. You can open and close the windows, uh, electric windows, electric seat. You can, you have a cigarette lighter. And I used to tell our manager in training, all cars have the cigarette lighter. Why do I have to mention it to the customer? All cars, uh, we can open and close windows. Why do I have to mention it to the customer? They tell me it doesn't matter. You have to go, over all the options even if the customer knows the options you have to build value in the vehicle look at this i can open and close the windows from here look at this you have a cigarette lighter here and you also have one on the bottom as an extra one look at the steering wheel we can move it up and we can move it down all the basic stuff we have to go over because we have to build value and we have to show the customer what the vehicle is all about and that's why when you see me review an item i go over a lot of details about that specific item and I show you what the item is all about. I learned that from being a car salesman where we have to talk about all the details. So I talk about all the details and I tell the customer to drive the vehicle and see how he likes it. Now the customer is still scared, he's not sure. He doesn't wanna drive it, he doesn't wanna commit to buying that vehicle, but they train you to let the customer feel at ease. No obligation, you're not obligated to buy the vehicle and just drive it, just see how it feels. So before that person drives the vehicle, we ask for the driver license because anybody who wanna try the vehicle, we must have his license in case something happened. So we take his license and we put it in the office. But also one other reason why we take the license is customer cannot run away. He has to go to the office to get his license before he leaves. It's all part of the plan. And everything is laid out on how to handle the customer from start to finish. Everything we talk with the customer is pre-programmed in our head and we know how to answer. For example, before I go into the riding the vehicle part, if a customer came in and asked, you do not want the customer to ask you, you wanna be the one who is asking the customer, but if a customer came in and asked, what's the price of that vehicle? We are programmed to answer the customer the price and jump to a question. Price of the vehicle is 23,446, where you're looking for automatic or stick shift. We answered and we jumped in to a question and we put the customer in a position where he has to answer. If the customer took control on the parking lot and he's the one who's asking the questions, 
and you are put in the position where you have to answer, 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 it's game over. You're not going to sell that car. You have to take control and you take control by asking questions. So the customer asks you, what's the price of the vehicle? 23446 Are you looking for automatic or stick shift? Oh, I was looking for automatic. Great. Are you looking for two doors or four doors? And then you just move them away from the price and you are talking about totally different thing. And if the customer insists talking about the price or talking about payments or talking about discounts, then you simply tell the customer that we will go over the numbers once we go inside. But now I just want to make sure that you like the vehicle, drive it and see how you like it. And we'll go over the numbers later on. And do not worry about that process. You want to put the customer at ease. So now the customer is inside the vehicle. He's driving the vehicle and he likes the vehicle. Awesome. The vehicle, it's a brand new vehicle. Of course, he's going to like it. Now, after the customer is done with the test drive, we pull over to the parking lot and I tell the customer, let's go inside so we can run the numbers and I'll tell you how much your payments will be and so that you can see what the numbers look like for that vehicle. And you go inside, the customer will follow you. Now the customer at some point may stop and tell you, I'm not ready to buy that vehicle, I just came to look. I was just looking at the vehicle, I'm not ready to buy, and my wife is not here, and I cannot make a decision without my wife, and all that stuff, that's normal. We get that with every single customer, that's normal. Every single customer will tell you exactly the same thing. And we are pre-programmed to overcome that obstacle and tell him it's okay, do not worry about it. Just come in, we'll run the numbers, and you are free to leave. That's what we are programmed to tell the customer. The customer will follow you to the office, and he goes inside. And I go inside the office, I grab an application, and I start to fill out the information. What's your first name? What's your last name? What's your number? Now, at some point, the customer may ask, why do you need my first name, my last name, my address, my phone number, in order to give me a quote on how much my monthly payment will be, or how much the vehicle costs? Again, we are trained and pre-programmed to tell the customer that we have to have your information on the application so we can submit the application to the sales manager and the sales manager is the person who's going to give us the numbers so I can show them to you. Customer agrees and he keeps going on with the information. I keep taking the information, I fill out the application. Now all I need is the approval of the customer and we sell him that vehicle. We have all the information on the application. Now I take that application, I go out to the manager, I give it to him. I tell him, okay, we are looking at this vehicle. The price of the vehicle is so-and-so. This is the customer's name and information. And I need a number. The manager will put down the number. I take the application. I go back to the customer. And the first thing I tell the customer is, great news. I got you the number. It's $430 a month. And I extend my hand. It's either that the customer is going to shake my hand or the customer is going to give you a reason why he cannot buy the vehicle right now. And it's almost always the customer will give you a reason to why he cannot buy the vehicle right now. But again, we are trained and pre-programmed to know how to answer if the customer decides that he does not want to buy the vehicle right now. So that specific customer told me, I love the car, I'm okay with everything, but uh, my wife is not here and I cannot buy a car if my wife is not here. She needs to look at the vehicle, she needs to drive the vehicle, and I cannot make a decision if she's not here with me. Now, I'm new as a salesman, and at that point, I did not know how to respond to that customer. I did not know how to overcome that obstacle and sell that customer the car. So I went to my manager and I told him that the customer does not want to buy the car because he cannot make a decision if his wife is not here, so on and so forth. And my manager was upset with me. He was upset that I was not able to overcome that obstacle and that I was not able to close that deal. And he went on saying, didn't we learn this in training? Didn't we discuss this in training? Didn't we go over this the last time we spoke about the wife issue? Follow me, let me show you how to close that deal. And I was anxious to see how that manager is going to close that deal when that customer clearly cannot make a decision if his wife is not here with him. And I was just sitting and watching and learning. And that's why I told you, being a car salesman, it's a learning experience and there's no other job that will give you more experience than being a car salesman because you get beat up left and right, up and down. I mean, you get beat up so much that it's all experience being a car salesman. So I'm following the manager. I want to see how that manager is going to close that impossible deal. Manager goes inside. He shakes hands with the customer. He hugs the customer. Hello, John, how is everything going? How was your stay at our dealership? How was Alex? Did Alex show you all the features inside the vehicle? Did Alex take you on a test drive? And suddenly it's all about Alex. How was Alex? Again, it goes back to psychology. 99% of customers are going to tell the manager that the salesman did a great job. And it's true. I did not do anything bad. All I did was show the customer the vehicle. I explained the features. I took him on a test drive. So the customer has nothing to say but good things. So no, no, Alex was great. Alex did his job. Alex 
uh, uh, pointed me to the right vehicle, but right now I cannot buy the vehicle because my wife is not here and I have to have my wife look at the vehicle and test drive the vehicle in order to make a decision. And I'm just sitting on the chair and I just want to see how that manager is going to close that deal. What is that manager going to say to the customer to make him buy that vehicle? And the manager suddenly said, oh, it's not a problem. Alex, I want you to take the customer, take that vehicle to his wife and let his wife drive the vehicle for as long as she wants and come back so we can close that deal. That's what the manager said. I'm looking at the manager. The customer is looking at the manager and none of us know how to answer. And I'm put in that position where I do not know if the customer is comfortable with what the manager just said. Maybe the customer doesn't want to do that, but he's too shy to tell the manager that he doesn't want to do that. And the customer is like, uh, um, uh, okay, okay. So I'm driving the car. I'm quiet and the customer is quiet. And I do not know how angry the customer is. I do not know if the customer, if that's what the customer wants. And I'm asking the customer, what's the address? Which way should we go? And we drive over to his house. He calls his wife. Hello, honey, can you come outside a bit? I want to show you a car. And I can hear his wife on the phone. What car? What car? We're not buying no car. And I'm, I'm just sitting, I do not know what to do. And uh, honey, can you just come outside to look at it? It's okay, just come outside to look at it. Even if we're not buying it, just come outside to look at it. And I'm quiet, I do not know, I honestly do not know what to do. And the wife came outside with her robe and she's like this. Who told you we are buying a car? Didn't we discuss this before? So she's fighting with the husband and I'm inside the car and I'm not doing anything. Again, it's a learning experience. When you get put in those positions, it's a learning experience. So we came back to the dealership and I told the customer to have a seat inside the office. I went outside to the manager and I told him what happened. I told him his wife does not want to buy a car. She has no interest in buying a car. She was yelling at him. She was fighting with him. She did not test drive the vehicle. And I'm back here at the dealership. And again, the manager was angry at me that, you know, I did not know how to control that situation. And he was angry at me that I was thinking negative and not positive because all they want you to do in the dealership is think positive, which is a good thing. I mean, thinking positive is a good thing because once you start thinking negative, then you will not know how to sell cars no more. And he told me, follow me. The manager went back inside and he greeted the customer with extending his hand. Should we shake on the deal? Everything is good. And the customer is like, oh, not really. Maybe I'm not ready to buy a car right now. And uh, the customer makes it clear that he does not want to buy the car. And now comes the ultimate question. The manager is going to ask the customer the ultimate question. Uh, so what was wrong? Is it the car that you do not like? Is it the price of the vehicle that you do not like? Or is it Alex that you do not like? He gave him three options, again with the question. Now, 99% of customers, they're not going to tell you that the problem is from the salesman. Because if the problem is from the salesman, they get him another salesman and they sell him that vehicle. 99% of customers are not going to tell you it's the vehicle because they do like the vehicle. So they are only left with one option and that's what they want customers to answer. Oh, it's the price. And that's what we want customers to answer, that the problem is the price. He told them what the problem is. So now the manager tells the customer, okay, great. So if the price is right, you will buy that vehicle, right? They want the customer to commit. And I can tell you that 75% of customers will say yes. We will buy it if the price is right. Manager leaves the office. He goes outside to the sales manager, the one higher than him. And he comes back to the customer with a $420 a month price quote. Before it was $430. They knocked off $10. And congratulations. I was able to get you the vehicle for $420 a month. Shake hands. And now the customer wants a better price. Now it's all about negotiating a better price and nothing to do with the wife anymore. And the customer is like, no, no, I'm not ready to pay $420 right now. And uh, uh, no. And now the manager goes on talking about how uh, the price is a great deal and how he was able to knock $10 off. But then again, let me see what I can do. He goes outside and then he comes back with maybe $3 less or $4 less on the payment, which equates to that much money if you think about it on a five-year period. And now the customer is almost there. He's almost tempted. And finally, the manager goes outside and he knocks off a few more dollars. And he, put, he extends his hand and the customer shakes his hand. Now, the first time the manager extended his hand, the customer did not shake it. The second time, the third time, it goes back to psychology. When you keep extending your hand, at some point, 
the customer is going to be shy and he's going to shake your hand. 75% of customers are going to be shy and the fact that you extended your hand more than a couple of times, they will shake your hand and they will accept the deal and we sold that customer the vehicle. Now, what did I get for myself selling that vehicle? The vehicle is $30,000. There's 10% profit in that vehicle. So there is about $3,000 profit in that vehicle. The salesman will get 20% of the profit. So I made myself $600 selling that vehicle. So there is money in selling cars and they did not lie to me when they told me that there is money in selling cars. But it's all about psychology. It's all about knowing how to deal with a customer. You do not sell a customer because you are good in talking and you know how to sell a car. No, you have to follow a procedure from start to finish. If you do not follow that procedure, you will not be able to sell not even one car. You start with a question. Hello, my name is Alex. What's yours? Are you looking for car, truck, SUV or van? And then whatever the customer tells you, you answer him and then you go back to another question. You take him on a test drive. Let me show you some numbers. You take him inside. You show him the numbers. Customer tells you, I'm not ready to buy. Then you ask him, is it me? Is it the vehicle? Is it the price? So on and so forth. And I learned so much working in a car dealership. Uh, even though I made good money working in a car dealership, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that I like. And that's why I encourage people to work in a job that they enjoy. Every time I fix a device, I smile because I enjoy the end result. That's what I like doing. A couple of things I learned from being a car salesman. You always have to think positive, even if it's a bad day. You will get bad days. We all get bad days. But it's how you deal with that bad day. And you have to think that tomorrow is going to be better. Maybe tomorrow is not better. After tomorrow is going to be better. You fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up. And at some point, you're going to be successful because of your attitude. I mean, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. In life, we fall a lot and we get back up. The person who lost his leg, they amputated his leg. He's not going to care about a scratch or a cut on his hand. He's been through a lot when he lost his leg. A scratch or a cut on his hand is minor. He's stronger now. In a dealership, they used to tell me, I have to talk to anything that moves. I have to greet and talk to anything that moves, except for maybe bugs and birds. Anything that moves, I have to talk to. I see a customer walking over there, I have to go and talk to him and attempt to sell him a car by using the same procedure. Hello, my name is Alex and yours. Working in a car dealership, working in such harsh conditions, where you have to deal with the customer, where you have to overcome obstacles, where you have to close a deal, where you have to not take no for an answer, and all those things that we go through, I think it's a harsh environment, but you gain a lot of experience being in such a harsh environment. When I say harsh environment, I mean uh, the communication between you and the customer. When the customer does not want to buy, but yet you still have to take his information and get him a quote and get him to buy the car. That's what I call harsh environment because uh, we are not born to know how to deal with these situations. We learn how to work with those situations. I used to be outside standing with other salespeople waiting for a car to come in. And when a car comes in, we have to call it. If I call it first, that's my customer. White car coming in, uh, guy with the black shirt coming in. So if I call that customer, I take him first. If two salespeople call on that one customer at the same time, then we have to flip a coin. Harsh environment. One time there was a customer walking outside the dealership. He's just walking in front of the dealership. He's not coming in to buy a vehicle. He's not looking at a vehicle and he's a person who's just passing by. And the manager told me to go and talk with that customer, ask him if he wants to buy a vehicle and take his name and number so we can call him later on and tell him what great deals we have and sell him a car. So I approached the customer and I told him, hello, my name is Alex, what's yours? And the person answered with, uh, I'm not buying a vehicle, I'm just passing by. I told him, oh, okay. And I did not want to talk to the customer anymore even though they want me to follow the steps and say everything. But uh, I told him, okay. And then I made believe that I'm taking his name and number. I wrote down Mike and some random number. And I went back inside and the manager told me, did you talk with the customer? I said, yeah, but uh, he does not want to buy a car. What did you tell him? I told him I followed the procedure, the, the procedure that we follow. He told me, did you get his name and number? I said, yeah, of course, right here. His name is Mike and that's his number. He said, great, we're gonna call him uh, tomorrow and we're gonna attempt to bring him over here because we have a great deal for him. I said, sure, why not? So the next day, manager told me to come inside his office. I went inside his office and he dialed that number on his speakerphone. It's like that manager knew that I did not 
take his name and number. He wanted to show me that I did not do my job. And I played along. I told him, okay, I dialed that number and a lady answered. I said, hi, can I speak to Mike? She said, who's Mike? I told her he was at our dealership uh, and we want to call him about a vehicle that we have on sale. She said, we do not have a mic here. Oh, sorry, thank you. And I told the manager that he gave me the wrong number. So the manager said, no, you did not take his number. He did not give you the wrong number. You did not take his number. I said, that's his name and number. I did take his name and number. I was lying and I never like to lie. I do not like to lie. But I was put in a position where I had to lie because I did not want to tell the manager that I did not take his name and number. I did not want to tell the manager that I did not follow the procedure on a guy walking outside the dealership and try to sell him a vehicle. I did not feel like that was right to convince a customer to come in to sell him a vehicle and he's only a passer. Uh, and that's why I hated that job and I hated that business, even though I was making good money. I mean, in that business, you do make money, but it's all mental. Uh, it gets to you. Uh, harsh environment, harsh environment. So what have I learned from being a car salesman? I have learned a lot of things. I have learned a lot of things, but some of the things I do not use in my business today, such as forcing the customer to fix something with us or forcing the customer to buy something from us. I do not use that technique and I will never use that technique. I understand that being in the car business is totally different than being in the electronics repair field because in the car sales business, a customer may approach you once every five years, once every seven years, once every three years. So if you do not sell that customer the car, somebody else will sell that customer the car. So that's why sometimes you have to put some pressure on the customer to buy because every customer, maybe 99% of customers, when they go to a dealership, none of them are committed to buy a car. It's the salesman that makes them buy the car. You're going to buy a $30,000 vehicle. You will have to think about it 100 times before you go and buy it. Car salesmen at a car dealership, they are not there to cheat you. I mean, all dealerships, they have the same exact price on their vehicles. Brand new vehicles have about 10% profit. You can negotiate that 10% profit. If the dealership is making $3,000 on a vehicle, you can negotiate as low as $300 over invoice. You can go online and search the invoice price of a vehicle and you will find that number. If you offer them $300 or $500 over invoice, they will sell you that car. A dealership wants to sell as many cars as they can because they will get a bonus from the factory for selling a certain amount of cars. So that's how a dealership works. They may raise your interest in finance and that's how they make money. They may offer a uh, warranty if you want to buy extended warranty or if you want to add a Bose speaker system in the vehicle or if you want to add spinning rims or if you want to add a special coat on the paint so it doesn't scratch or whatever the case may be, that's how they make their money in the dealership. So what positive things have I learned from being a car salesman? I have learned that it's all about psychology. If you know how that customer thinks, if you are prepared to answer whatever question the customer throws at you, you will most likely gain their business. If a customer asks a question and you stumble or you are confused or you do not know how to answer or you're going back and forth with the customer or taking the customer from looking at this device or that vehicle or that I do not know what back and forth playing pinball with the customer, you will most likely not gain the customer's business. So being prepared to answer whatever question comes at you could be the line between making the deal or breaking the deal. Psychology. So in the electronics repair business, how do I know what customers will ask? That will only come with time. After a while, you will detect a pattern on what customers ask. That brings me over to the second point, which is experience. I mean, what is experience? The way I define experience is, let's say today I failed at fixing this device. After one month, I'm now able to fix that device. That's experience. I gained experience. I was not able to fix it before, but now I'm able to fix it. Or it could be that I fixed this device and after a couple of months, I discovered an easier way to fix that device. That's experience. I gained more experience. Experience also comes when you communicate with customers. Every customer is different. You will come to know that every single customer is different. Some customers are positive. Some customers are negative. Some customers they uh, do not want the good for you. Some customers, they want to leave you a negative feedback. Some customers, they appreciate what you do. Some customers do not appreciate what you do. So uh, dealing with so many customers every single day, you will build up that experience. And at some point you will know how to deal with every single customer. Whereas if you go into business fresh and you do not have the experience 
on dealing with customers, you're going to trip everywhere. You're going to fall and get back up, fall and get back up, fall and back up. And you get up to that level where you now know how to work and deal with all sorts of customers. The third thing I learned from being a car salesman is you will come out to be a person that has a stronger personality, better public speaker, more self-confidence. I mean, I still remember when I first took that job as a car salesman, I used to be afraid or not so confident to approach the customer and go through the process of selling that customer that $30,000 vehicle. It's not easy to sell a customer a high tag item, $30,000, $40,000, $20,000. Me, as a beginner, I used to be afraid to approach the customer. Not that because I'm a shy person or I do not know how to talk. No, it's because it gets to you. The dealership is trusting you to communicate with the customer and sell him a car. So you do not want to let them down. You want to show them that you are up to the task, that you can do the job. Uh, so you will build a stronger personality. You will have more self-confidence. You will be more fluent in the way you talk because they train you and they program you to know how to answer. So when a customer asks you a question, you know how to answer. Your self-confidence will go up high, especially when they train you that you are the one that should be asking the questions and not the customer, which brings me over to the fourth point. The person who is asking the question is always the stronger party. You are stronger when you are asking the question. You are weaker when you are answering the question. Just like a police officer who pulls you over because you have done something wrong. When the police officer approaches you, he does not tell you, I pulled you over because you did something wrong. They start with a question. Do you know why I pulled you over? They want you to answer because when you are answering, you are the weaker person. The police can easily tell you, I pulled you over because you did so, so, so and so. But no. Rather than doing that, they start with a question. Do you know why I pulled you over? And then you will be in a weak spot where you have to answer to the officer and uh, it goes on from there. So the person who is asking is always the stronger person. That's point number four. Number five is guiding the customer. You have to know how to guide that customer. If a customer goes inside a dealership, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of cars. If you do not guide that customer, the customer is going to get lost between this car, this car, this car, this car, this car, this car, and he's going to end up not buying any vehicle because he is lost. He does not know which vehicle to buy. He want to do more research on all those vehicles, and then the sale is not going to happen. So when a customer comes in, we have to guide that customer. Are you looking for two doors or four doors? Are you looking for car, van, truck, or SUV? How many kids do you have? You have six kids, then we have to eliminate two-door cars. We have to eliminate four-door cars and we have to stick to either SUV or van. Customer does not like vans, he wants an SUV. Okay, you have six kids, SUV, the only SUV that will work for you is the seven-seater or the eight-seater. And then we narrow down all the options to one vehicle. Just like if a customer came in to our shop here, electronics repair shop, and he wanna fix a laptop that does not power on. I have to make it easy on the customer. I have to tell the customer it's likely a charging port issue, the charging circuit, and we'll take care of it. Do not worry about anything. We'll take care of the process and it's gonna cost you so and so. But if I went on telling the customer that, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on here. It could be the MOSFET that communicates with the CPU and maybe the, C the V core circuit of the CPU is not working, but we'll find out and we'll let you know. And then you go back and forth, back and forth. The customer will be confused. And now the customer maybe wanna do more research to see what you are talking about. And you do not do that. It's not powering on. It's likely due to the charging circuit. It's going to cost you so-and-so. Do not worry about anything. We'll take care of it, and we'll call you when it's ready for pickup. The customer feels at ease, and he will give you the laptop. Okay, go ahead and do it, and you take it in. I called a roofing company a few days ago. We want to change the roof on our house. The roof is about 20, 30 years old, and it's time that we change that roof. So I called a few companies to get a quote on how much it would cost to replace the roof. The first company, they gave me a quote and all they asked was the size of the house. They did not ask what tile I want. They did not ask uh, how old the roof is. They did not ask the basic questions that a company should ask in order to give you a proper quote. They did not even give me an option to choose what roof I want. If I want a tile roof, if I want shingles or whatever the case may be. Thank you very much. I called company number two and the person answers. Uh, is your roof two layers, one layer, how many layers? What are the size of the shingles that you have? Uh, the length of the metal rods that go on the side. And they started asking me technical questions to a point where I felt like if I knew how to answer those questions, I would 
probably be a rule for myself. And I told him, I do not know. You will have to see and give me an estimate. And he said, you need to get us those details so we can give you a proper quote. So I felt like the person did not want to put any effort in providing a quote. Thank you very much. I called company number three. And the person tells me, I'll be at your house tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'll inspect the roof and I'll give you a quote. I felt comfortable. I felt that that person is going far and beyond and he want to come over to the house to physically inspect the roof to give me a quote. I was happy. He gave me a price and I was still not sure if that price was low or high, if I'm being overpriced or if that's the market value for changing the roof. So I called yet another roofing company and they gave me a higher price. So I stuck to company number three because of the fact that they offered to come and look at the house before they give me an estimate. So sometimes when you show the customer that you are going far and beyond to work on their device or to sell them an item, you will most likely gain their business. The sixth thing I learned from being a car salesman is you need to talk about the details. When we are selling a car, they tell you, you have to explain all the features inside the car. Look at this. You have electric windows. You have uh, power seats. You have a cigarette lighter here. You have another one on the bottom here. And then you explain all the details, even though all the vehicles have electric windows, all vehicles have a cigarette lighter. We still have to explain it so we can build value. When I'm selling an item, I do not really talk about all the details so I can build value in that item. No, I talk about the details because I feel like those details are important for the customer to know before they purchase that item. When I'm talking about this tweezer, I'm telling you, this tweezer is long. It's the longest tweezer that we have. That information is important. You want to know what's so special about this tweezer. It's the longest one that we have. It feels comfortable in the hand. It has weight to it, which feels good. It has those holes, which is anti-slip. I feel like those details are important. And anytime I'm selling something or I'm reviewing an item, I usually go over the details that I feel are important for the customer to know. In car sales, it's a bit different because you are telling the customer stuff that he already knows. Uh, power windows, power seats, cigarette lighter. You have to do that when you are a car salesman and not only in the dealership that I worked in, but every dealership in the world, they go over the same exact thing. So talk about details, build value. Point number seven, they trained us in the dealership for every five, six no's, you will get a yes. So the more people you talk to, the more likely you will make a sale. I go and greet this customer. The customer does not want to buy a car and there's no way to sell him a car. Next, you go on to customer number two. You go on to customer number three. Maybe you get one no, two no's, three no's, four no's. Maybe you get the customer inside the office and it turns out to be a no sale because he has bad credit or because whatever the case may be. You go on and you keep talking to customers. Every five no's, you will get a yes. Maybe sometimes every three no's, you will get a yes. Or maybe sometimes every seven no's, you will get a yes. But if you do not talk to people, you're not going to get that yes. The more people you talk to, the more yeses you will get. That's a very important point. I forgot, was I point number six or seven? Anyway, harsh situations only makes you stronger. When you are put in a harsh environment or when you are in a tough situation, you will come out of that situation being a stronger person. You think that I may never be able to get out of that situation, but when you do get out of that bad situation, you will become a stronger person. So the more you fall and get up, the more experience you have, the stronger you are. And it's very unlikely that anything minor will break you. Harsh situations or harsh environments will make you a stronger person. Just like a person in the army, they get grilled inside. They get grilled like no other situation out there. They get put under a lot of stress and they come out to be stronger, stronger personality, strong speaking, strong build. Everything about them will be stronger. Unlike a person who sits home all day, does not think about the future. All he does is play games and hope for the best. There's a big difference between those two people. So when you are put in a harsh environment, when you face hard situations, you will come out of those situations being a stronger person. I have learned that being positive does work. Nothing good comes out of being negative. Maybe today I did not sell a car. That's okay. Tomorrow I'm going to sell two cars. Tomorrow I did not sell a car. The day after is going to be better. When you are in the positive mentality, you will do a lot better than when you are in a negative mentality. When you are thinking negative, maybe you will stop approaching the customer. Maybe you will talk to the customer in a way 
where it shows that you have no interest talking with the customer. Maybe you will get angry at the customer. Maybe you will not know how to answer the customer. So being negative is a no-no and you always have to stay positive. And sometimes it's hard to think positive when you are in a very bad situation, but you have to remember that whatever goes down have to go back up. Nothing keeps going down and nothing keeps going up. Life is like a sine wave, up and down, up and down, up and down. You have to work with whatever situation you face and you always have to think positive. I think I went through all the points. I have some notes written on the screen here and I'm just quickly going over them to see if I missed anything. And I do not think so. Uh, that's it. Right now it's almost 8 p.m. Time to go home. I'm going to end it right here. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope this video was beneficial to you in one way or another. Leave it down in the comments. Let me know what you think and we'll do something else in the next video.